right, well, this is me. Um, thank you for coming to talk about Gothic Encounters with Sacred Statues and Divine Retribution. Um, yeah, Sam, happy to start recording and I'll just um, get going. Some really quick content warnings um, before we start, just because I'm conscious that not everybody will know all of these stories. Um, there is some implied sexual assaults in some of these stories, murder of both men and women, including religious sacrifice, some mild horror and some very current statue discourse, in particular in the UK, which is tied up the moment with the um, recent killing of Sarah Everard, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end. And um, yes, yeah, so that's at the very end. And I just want to flag that for UK based people. Um, so on we go. Um, when we're talking about encountering statues and goddesses, this is perhaps the fantasy of the statue. So Pygmalion and Ovid's Metamorphoses is unable to love any of the mortal women in Cyprus because of disgust at prostitution. He sculpts his own ideal woman in the likeness of Aphrodite and becomes enamored of her. When Aphrodite's feast day comes, he makes offerings at Aphrodite's altar and wishes for a wife who resembles his beautiful statue. Returning to his workshop, he kisses the statue and finds her warm to his touch. And that's the moment that's being captured here. And they live happily ever after, maybe. Um, I mentioned Me Too here on this slide because there's some really interesting work about the issues of consent and transgressive touching of statues in the 19th century, being done by scholars like Patricia Pullum at the moment. There's lots to be said about Pygmalion's strange erotic obsession with a statue woman who can't move, about the statue woman as a possession. Um, I'm not able to talk very explicitly about that today, but I just want to acknowledge that that sits in the background of this topic. Um, and that there is an undercurrent in the Pygmalion story itself in Ovid. Um, it's not all sweetness and light. Robert Graves, the extensive companion of Greek myths, notes that the source of Ovid's Pygmalion story is likely the misuse by Cypriot king Pygmalion of the Aphrodite cult image or statue to prolong his kingship. The sexualized capture of the figure of the goddess was a means of retaining political power probably enacted, he speculates, by Pygmalion marrying the next priestess who was to be queen. So if there's something sexually and politically aggressive lurking in the Pygmalion myth, then in looking at these five stories, I'm interested in the ways that statues fight back. These are statues that represent not just the beautiful, but in some way or other the divine. And as we'll see, they broke no transgression. Um, and Given the title, I just want to sort of talk briefly about the divine right. So if the European political doctrine of the divine right of kings acted as a justification for monarchic absolutism, so it put monarchs as unanswerable to any earthly authority, which um, was subsequently eroded by a sequence of 18th and early 19th century revolutions and the Napoleonic Wars, we might talk about the divine right of statues themselves representative of the divine as a right to confer power and punish as they see fit. So in these stories, agency is transferred from the Pygmalion figure, creating, controlling, and co-opting the divine statue to the statue itself. Um, the power is reversed and often fatally. Um, and not all of these, uh, these stories would necessarily um, strike you as sort of obvious Gothic literature. So just want to talk a little bit about um, how it's sort of situated within the Gothic genre. Um, we find ourselves not quite in the Gothic uh, castle in these stories, but in locations with something of that air about them. So the stories occupy mausoleums, cathedrals and temples, both restored and jury rigged. The dark of their interior, especially at night, and the sounds and concealed motions within that darkness are our companions in these tales, from the voices of abandoned lovers to the scraping of statues moving in the gloom. They have in mind the sense of the Gothic as a now not discrete genre so much as a um, quote collection of Victorian gestures of sensibility. I'm quoting Jarlath Killeen and her history of the Gothic. And all of these stories, I think, bring the past into a tense relationship with the present they describe. So that sort of antagonism towards pre-modern forms of living combined with the desire for them. And again, I'm quoting Killeen there. Um, before I get going on the stories themselves, just a quick note about the text and quotations that you'll um, see on the slides. These stories aren't all readily accessible online in one place or might take some tracking down. Uh, and several of them were not written in English, 
So I've gathered them together as annotatable versions in the studio portion of COVE, which is the Collaborative Organization for Virtual Education's website. You'll see highlighting in some annotations on many of the screenshots in here, which are taken from COVE. Um, anyone who's a member of any of the Victorian Studies Associations is welcome to read and annotate the anthology that I've put together for this. Um, and I would be really interested to sort of know if anybody um, would like to do that and hear what people have to say about the stories themselves. So getting going then um, on Vernon Lee. Lee is now best known for some of her supernatural stories, but she published extensively in genres like travel writing, art criticism and historical studies of music. She was born in France to British immigrants and lived most of her life in Italy, particularly in Florence. And her career spanned the mid 19th century through to well into the modernist period. But she fell out of fashion early in the 20th century. Her pacifist writings during World War I particularly alienated readers. Um, so I want to begin with one of her more well-known stories from her 1890 collection of supernatural tales, Hauntings. Dionia plays with the gods and exile trope from Heinrich Heine's 1854 essay of that same name, Gods in Exile, in which he imagines Greek and Roman gods living often malevolently in obscurity in contemporary Christian culture. Dionia is told through one half of a set of correspondence, letters from Dr. De Rosis to Lady Evelyn Savelli, rendering its narration particularly unreliable. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we work through it. So the titular Dionia is only a child when she arrives at the Italian shore as a shipwreck survivor. It's a very young child without much by way of Italian and certainly nothing of Christianity about her. From the moment of her arrival, however, we are invited to believe that she is Aphrodite in the flesh. The name Dionia is an infrequently used alternate name for Aphrodite, um, derived from the name often given for Aphrodite's mother, Dion. And the goddess has arisen before from that sea, as Derosus muses in this first highlighted passage here, in the time of the Phoenicians and the Greeks, a quote, Venus verticordia in the bad sense of the word. Um, throughout, Dionia is associated with the traditional accompaniments of Aphrodite, so myrtle, pigeons, doves, and in the annotations here on Cove, I've included a um, quick snap of a Dante Gabriel Rossetti painting of a Venus Verticordia from the 1860s, surrounded by those same authors. So the story offers a really unusual vision of what the life of an infant and slowly growing pagan goddess might entail in the hostile Christian community she finds herself in. Lee's story depends for its tension on two key things. So first, um, although De Rosas is a supposed scholar, a la Hein, he seems incapable of realizing, or at least acknowledging in his letters, Dionia's true nature as a Venus Verticordia. Um, and I'll, you, throughout, I'm gonna use uh, Aphrodite and prefer the Greek, as we're told um, here at the bottom that she arrives in a Greek boat. Um, and the second key thing that lends Lee's story its interest is the question of how malevolent Dione will be as a quote, baleful goddess of beauty, capable of overwhelming men's lives in sudden darkness. And we have a early hint of this in the quote, certain repugnance she elicits from the local authority, uh, the local community rather, even when she's a half drowned four year old. Um, so Diana is educated thanks to Lady Evelyn's money at the nearby convent, but she's much maligned by her fellow children and the nuns of the convent, particularly because she seems to inspire quote, inappropriate loves wherever she goes. Um, so for example, a nun, Sister Juliana, runs off with a sailor. But um, the key feature really of the story is the unwanted attentions that Diana herself suffers. The first is the case of Padre Domenico, an apparently devout and honourable religious man who is beset by fleshly thoughts. In the full story, De Rosis tells a little bit more of how he um, goes through a journey of spiritual and mental decline. But we have in this middle quotation here, the outcome. So death and a prospective scandal if the fact that it was death by suicide becomes known. De Rosis complies with the superior's request to conceal this fact of suicide and makes out a death certificate stating apoplexy as cause of death. But he's later shocked to discover that Dionia knows a good deal about the truth, she says, so he has killed himself with charcoal. Um, and this is an acute early instance of what Dionia appears to have by way of forbidden, worldly or profane knowledge 
but perturbs Derosis and doesn't seem to jive with the Catholic education she's being given. In a second instant, Derosis is more sympathetic to her. Donia, at this point, grown is working as a maid at the house of Signor Agostino, a wealthy nobleman. The precise facts are left to our imagination, but Derosis' judgment of Agostino is clear. He pities Dionia her exposure to, quote, the passions of a once patriarchally respectable old man, now seen as a vile old creature characterized by audacity and sacrilegious madness. Precisely what is sacrilegious about Agostino's behavior is unclear, but this may be an unconscious slip by Derosis, suggesting that his recognition of Dionia as Aphrodite made flesh is suppressed rather than entirely absent. What is clear from what we're told is that an improbable lightning bolt kills the man scarcely 20 meters from Dionia, who remains unharmed, and she appears to have somehow summoned it as a ominous warning that heaven would send him an accident, the tests. Um, and you're probably thinking about now, where's the statue? Um, so, okay, we'll get to it. Um, the rest of the tale after these incidents revolves around Lady Evelyn's friends who come to stay in the village, the sculptor of Aldemar and his quote, thin, delicate lipped little Madonna wife, Gertrude. So we have our prospective Pygmalion. Oh wait, he only sculpts boys and men's. Um, no broad flanked Aphrodite we're told. Well, okay, so maybe all as well. Yeah, probably not. Um, Gertrude the Memling Madonna, we called her here, and her sculpture of male forms are uh, more complex after all. Uh, Gertrude has apparently been hunting for a woman who might serve as a good model because her husband's artistic credentials have been criticized for never having produced a female form. Valdemar has his own ideas about why mortal women are an inappropriate subject for sculpture. He says they are merely, quote, expression. But Gertrude is persistent and unsurprisingly hits on Dionia as a potential model. The idea of a young woman modeling scandalizes Derosis, but when Gertrude insists Dionia, quote, will do for Venus, and note the casual judgment of will do, uh, Dionia herself has no such qualms. Instead, serpentine, Dionia seems indifferent to the idea until Valdemar appears to remind them all that he does not want to sculpt a female figure. Her contrariness is activated and she immediately consents. Donia here seems to reverse the experience that Lee described in 1881 um, in her essay, The Child in the Vatican. In that essay, there's an eroticized turn for the growing child who shifts from seeing the beautiful statues of the Vatican as, quote, dull things in their dirty whiteness to enrapturing sensual 3D objects. For Valdemar here, it is the female body that goes from a thing with, quote, no story to tell to a form that he simply must capture, despite Dionia's warning song hinting at her divine birth. So Derosis's anxieties about chastity are quelled pretty quickly by Valdemar's, quote, curious attitude of indifference, almost brutal in its coldness towards his model. But that cold brutality of indifference erupts into less than indifferent violence when Dionia appears to grow more beautiful and goddess-like in response to the beauty of his work. As her beauty, quote, disproves the nonsense of aesthetic theories about the ideal in art, it also frustrates Valdemar, and he violently damages parts of his statue, much to the distress of Paul Gertrude, who um, turned ashy white and a convulsion passed over her face as some sort of ominous premonition. Valdemar's obsessive work on the statue comes to a head when he discovers an altar in DeRose's collection, like the one that's featured here. His eye suddenly fell upon a little altar, we're told, one of my few antiquities, a little block of marble with a carved garland and ram's heads and a half a face inscription dedicating it to Venus, the mother of love. Derosis generously lends the altar to Valdemar, but the servants who deliver the altar return with an odd tale of his libation at the altar. So Valdemar has begun to believe and indeed begun to worship. Um, so this chunk is from the uh, penultimate letter in the story, um, setting out the subsequent disaster for Lady Evelyn. It follows an unshared exchange of telegrams and begins by referring to the Valdemar family with the ominous line, the children are safe. An enormous fire has swamped Valdemar's studio, we find, and the flames of the thatched roof of the Templecom workshop drew everyone down from the village to discover him, dead at the bottom of the cliff, 
and his wife, also dead, across to Rose's donated altar. Her throat slit like a sacrificial lamb, Gertrude lies amongst heaps of roses and incense. We learn that having found he has the goddess Aphrodite at his disposal, Voldemort has made of her a living statue, setting her up on a pedestal behind the altar, showing her to others in this way, as DeRosa describes at the top here, and creeping out in the night to look at her, obsessed, in fact, with looking at her. So we're left to speculate. Did Valdemar hope for a Pygmalion-esque moment with Dionia after sacrificing Gertrude on her altar? Did Dionia send him an accident from heaven, killing him, or merely reject him, leading to a suicide? We cannot know as she disappears and is sighted by a sailor on a boat very like the one on which she arrived, with eyes painted on the hull. The now grown Aphrodite leaves the community as mysteriously as she arrived, a trail of destruction in her wake. Possibly righteous, possibly capricious, likely both. If we think back to the possible story behind the myth of Pygmalion and the catch of the cult image of the goddess to retain power, Aphrodite is struck back as those at the heart of institutions that might have sought to abuse or ill use her, the church, the patriarchal family, and art itself. Rapacious obsessions, destructive force, is then turned back on itself. Um, so I want to contrast Lee's story of Dionia, which I've dwelt on a bit to sort of elicit some of our themes. And I want to contrast Dionia's sculpted and sculptural form with a weaker sort of sculptural obsession and marital peril, written a decade earlier or so. Um, Henry James was an American author who traveled extensively in Europe and became a British citizen shortly before his death. He's now best known for his novels and novellas, but he also wrote plays and many essays. Um, and I want to talk through the last of the Valeri. Like Dionia, it's narrated by an older man who's in a position of quasi-paternal relation with a beautiful young woman. In James's story, however, the young woman is his young American goddaughter, Martha, who is marrying into the Italian nobility via Count Valerio. Very early on in the story, James establishes competing aesthetic competences and religious beliefs for the couple, similar to what we've seen in Dionia. So Count Valerio is described as, quote, a little stupid and particularly slow in matters of taste and politics compared to the Americans. While the narrator thinks of his goddaughter converting the Italian Catholic to Protestantism, and she inclines towards converting in the opposite direction, her betrothed declines both options, noting that he himself has been accused of being more a pagan than a Catholic. So into this atmosphere, as in Dionia, comes the idea of a marble statue of the old gods to be potentially unearthed at Villa Valerio through Martha's architectural zeal in restoring the gently decaying villa. Camillo, Count Valerio, has some really quite excellent advice for his wife about the proposed project of digging up whatever old Roman gods might lie beneath the earth. His initial warning is very clear. It would be an act of sacrilege, quote, if you can't believe in them, to disinter them. But when pressed, he alludes to the influence that the statues have over him as representatives of, quote, things seen and done here that live in the whisker of the leaves and the odour of the mouldy soil and their blank eyes. As a harbinger of what is to come then, he warns her of the threat to his sanity of digging up more of the, quote, poor disinherited gods. And yet Martha persists. A beautiful statue is duly unearthed, an amply draped Juno rather than a Venus. And the Count predicts it in a dream, which is uh, set out in the right-hand quotation here. Remember his impression that he, as an old Italian, has a special connection to the figures and forms of old Roman goddesses. While the statue has an attractive quality for the narrator, described in the top quotation, to the Count she seems to call like a whisper that only he can hear, and reaches out to touch him by the hand, ominous given that the Juno's hand is found separately to the rest of her and goes missing, quote unquote, shortly after she's first uncovered. So that first dream touch seems to have something in common with Pygmalion's first tentative kiss of Galatea as she transforms from marble to flesh. But here in Camillo's dream, it is initiated by the statue woman, not her male possessor. So things are not quite as they may seem. The husband and wife are invited to toast the statue's discovery here at the bottom. But while the Countess takes it as a formality, the Count is moved to a religious act, a libation much like Voldemar's. And indeed, the effect of the statue on the Count is very similar to the effect of Dionia on Voldemar. 
Camilla begins to be restless. Uninterested in his lovely wife, he attends the statue at all hours and protects it jealously from others. After word of the unknown thing gets out, art critics and artists flock to the house to try to see the genome, but he turns them all away, denying that she exists at all. After an initial viewing, even the other occupants of the house are excluded, with the Gino shut up in a private viewing space for the Count alone. The excavator who found her wonders, what does he do, after all, while sitting there with the statue on his solitary visits? Well, we begin to get a sense of what it is he might do there. The Count's obsession is understood in the story by the narrator as a religious deviation, falling into paganism from which the narrator suggests these two Americans can save him. His beautiful Christian wife is thought of as a quote, sacrifice. But in this case, the sacrifice is of a life spent happily with her rather than the sacrifice of her life, as with Paul Gertrude and Dania. The Countess and her godfather go to challenge the Count over his spousal neglect and find the room where the statue is stowed surprisingly unlocked. Slipping in, they find a scene similar to that described by Derosis in Valdemar's temple come studio, a makeshift altar before the goddess, and a slightly less dramatic blood sacrifice. That physical demonstration of the Count's paganism and the extremes to which he might go in his worship is enough for Contessa. The goddess's spell, her effects must be contained, she decides. In essence, the Countess joins her husband rather too late in his initial instinct that whatever is under the ground should be left there. Simply disposing of the statue in other ways, such as selling it, um, is not enough for Martha. She is insistent that, quote, he'll not be himself as long as she is above ground. Now, in the hands of Vernon Lee, uh, based on Dionia, we might imagine that the, the Juno could fight back somehow through the Count or otherwise, but that's not so here in James's story. The burial scheme goes without a hitch, and like a spell being lifted, the Count throws himself on his wife's mercy once more. But that's not quite the end, and the victory is not quite complete. The detached hand of the Juno lives on in the Count's collection and evidently in his thoughts. And I don't know quite what to do with the last line here, that the statue is the statue of a Greek, as the story largely sticks to the Roman names for gods, and the Count emphasizes a sort of local attachment to the soil and the spirits it houses. So his rebuttal here serves to counter his friend's implication that the hand is a modern sculpture of a living Roman woman and former lover but it also suggests something deeper in the Count's pagan longing for and worship of the Juno statue, which has not been exercised by the return of the rest of the statue to the hole in the ground. So Valeri thus hints more at a ghostly haunting, a sort of afterlife of feeling and memory than Dionia does. Uh, we can wonder whether the Count frowns because he's been misunderstood or because his friend has called to his recollection the fact that the Juno is mere meters from him and could be retrieved. Either way, she uncannily lives on in the Valeri's marriage. If we come back to Lee then, I want to talk about another of her stories from the late 1880s that also reflects a sort of weak admonition of excessive statue love. And in this case, it's satirical admonition of a particular form of Catholic saint worship. So while the preceding two stories suggest a sort of excess in the neo-paganism of Valdemar and Camilo, which might be implicated in the threat that is seemingly posed by the statues. Functionally, there's little difference in how Christian statues operate in the remaining three stories we're going to go through. The Virgin of the Seven Daggers, Lee's story was first published in French in 1896. It's an invented Andalusian folk tale or what Sandeep Kandala has called, quote, an inventive tale that feverishly mixes Spain's historical encounter with the Moors to decadent impiety, pantomime scenes of necromancy, orientalist fantasies of fairy treasure, and the mildly profane and comic spectacle of Don Juan's accession to heaven. And I'm afraid I only have time to talk about that very final bit really, uh, but it's a great story. Um, critics such as Lara Barrera Medrano and Sarah Barnett have explored Lee's own late 1880s visit to Spain and her self-confessed discomfort with what she saw as an excessive religious iconography of Catholic churches in Spain, in particular depictions of the Virgin in agony. So in Virgin of the Seven Daggers, Lee critiques that excessive iconography by painting it, pairing it with an ironically excessive indulgence of the libertine Don Juan. I want to say just a little bit about the story of Don Juan, um, which is told in a number of iterations over the centuries, 
um, as the tale of a legendary seduce of women who meets his death and something like justice at the hands of a statue. In most tales, Don Juan's punishment of death is meted out upon him by the statue of the father of one of the women he has seduced. He is dragged to hell by the statue, either because he declines to repent or because God refuses to grant him pardon. In some of the tales, however, like Zuria's Don Juan Tenorio, intercession by a purer soul, in that case, Doña Inés, acting from purgatory, allows him an opportunity to ascend to heaven. And that's the trope that Lee works with here. Um, so Lee's version of the Don Juan story is set in Granada in and around the Alhambra. The conflict between religions is present here too, as in the preceding stories, and it almost becomes a battle of two beautiful female statues, one Catholic, one Muslim. In brief in Virgin, Don Juan plots to find and seduce an infanta who has been buried alive in a lavish tomb by her father, King Yaya of Cordova. Don Juan employs a Jewish sorcerer to open the cleft of the tomb, closed for hundreds of years, and then he murders the man by shoving him from the precipice. Throughout the endeavor, Don Juan calls on the Virgin to protect him, even at moments when he is blaspheming and murdering, as illustrated in the first quote here. His Christian devotions are, quote, mechanical, like oaths that many English speakers swear today without any particular Christian affiliation. What Lee seems to object to is Don Juan's hypocrisy, and subsequently, as we'll see, the hypocrisy of the saint and her indulgence of him. As Don Juan advances to the tomb, forms, I'll say statues, although Lee is not explicit, stir into life, breathing, bowing, and generally awakening. In the middle of the tomb, the infanta sits, veiled by fabrics that render her, quote, as an unfinished statue. The beautiful infanta seems not to move, and yet she magically speaks. Through her translators, the chief duenna and the chief eunuch, she quizzes Don Juan about whether she is more beautiful than all of the women he has previously seduced, whose voices have called to him as he ventured through the tomb to this chamber. He answers each time, impatiently, yes, and he's repeatedly checked by the chief eunuch whenever he tries to cut short the question and touch the infanta. Then the fatal question comes, is she more beautiful than the version of the Seven Daggers? Don Juan, the notorious deceiver, must choose. And here, apparently, his Christian piety wins out over his lasciviousness. He answers in the negative, and he is promptly decapitated by a warrior who springs out of nowhere at the eunuch's command. Following his decapitation, Don Juan wakes in a pile of rubble beneath one of the Alhambra's towers, believing himself to have dreamt the entire scenario. He walks to the town, sees a commotion and pushes through it, uh, and he finds himself staring at his own decapitated corpse. What we might imagine that his encounters with the Infanta and her entourage were hallucinations in the tomb, imagining the statue to come to life, we and Don Juan must now deal with the consequences of a murder carried out by one of those imaginings, his murder. He stumbles into the church of the Virgin of the Seven Daggers, knowing himself to be, quote, infallibly within a few moments of hell. He bitterly criticizes the Virgin, who he interprets as having disdained his, quote unquote, faithfulness and loyalty, allowing him to die in the midst of mortal sin. His recriminations place the blame for the circumstances of his death by statue on the Virgin rather than on himself. In that moment, however, the couple are opens and he begins to ascend heavenwards to meet the apparently forgiving Virgin face to face. The tale of Don Juan ends there, and the story concludes with a two paragraph explanation of how it came to be told in this way. Lee pretends that such a story had been considered by the actual Spanish author Pedro Calderon de la Barca as a fit subject for a play to, quote, spread the glory of our holy church, but was never completed and thus fell into her hands. That final framing narrative places the emphasis of the tale firmly on the nature of Catholic worship of the Virgin. And Lee transforms the punishment of the faithless lover common to Don Juan stories into the punishment of an apparently faithful one to criticize an apparently hypocritical sort of Catholic devotion to saints. For Lee in this story, there seems to be little to choose between the Infanta and the Virgin, both of which are memorialized, guarded sculptures of beautiful chaste figures who demand absolute fealty and come to life at the prospect of it. What either have to offer, Lee seems to imply, is not genuinely sustaining for mortal worshippers. So it's a cautionary tale. Um, finally then, I want to explore a little more how that demand for absolute Christian devotion manifests itself when it is violated. Uh, Gustavo Adolfo Becker is most known for his dreamers, his poetry, and his leyendas, his short folk tales, often published together as the imaginatively named Rumas and Leyendas. He was also a skilled artist like his father and brother Valeriano, whose portrait of him is here, 
although Gustavo never focused on that area of his work, instead preferring to write. Um, starting with Becker's The Golden Bracelet, then, this slander offers a contrasting view of the Virgin's act presented in Seven Daggers, and much more akin to Lee's Dionia in the consequences of sacrilege that she seemingly provokes and then punishes. Uh, like Lee's Virgin, Bracelet establishes a tension between sexual love and spiritual piety. Becker introduces us to Maria and Pedro, two lovers, and in introducing them, sets out the characteristics that will steer the story. In her beauty, Maria is something of Dania about her, uh, something excessive, supernatural, and fatalistic, uh, coming perhaps from the devil himself. Pedro loves her fatalistically, as her beauty seems to demand. It's a love, quote, infused with the punishment of some sin. He seems willing to suffer for the love of such a woman as Maria, and while she is capricious and extravagant, he is superstitious and courageous. The seesaw tilts rather in her favour, although Becker avoids passing judgment on either of the main characters. One day, Pedro comes across Maria crying, alone on a tower above the river. Um, at first, Maria refuses to tell Pedro why she's crying, but eventually he forces her to confess her, quote, mad fancy that will make you laugh. During prayers at the Festival of the Virgin in the Cathedral, Maria has become obsessed with a beautiful golden bracelet on the arm of the Statue of the Virgin. It has become haunting her in her dreams, and she is distraught at the idea that she'll never possess it. Pedro is horrified by the prospect that she would want it, and implicitly that he might have to take it for her, especially given that the bracelet belongs to the patron saint of Toledo. Just as Count Valerio in the last of the Valeri highlighted the importance of his connection with the soil and gods of Rome, so Pedro's attachment to the patron saint of Toledo comes into tension with his attachment to his lover. We know not how, but Pedro is persuaded to try the theft, and he breaks into the cathedral to carry out what Becker calls his criminal purpose. The narrator figures the cathedral as a place of worship, but also a place of unreality. It's a, quote, forest of sculptured trees populated by imaginary and real beings, given life by the genius of their sculptors. The empty cathedral itself instills fear into Pedro, with the sound of suppressed sobs and figures moving around outside his field of vision. Determined but terrified, he climbs up to the statue, surrounded in the darkness by, quote, chimerical and horrible forms. It is the mute and unmoving smile of the calm, kind and serene virgin that terrifies him the most, however. Having effected his crime and grasped the golden bracelet, he cannot bear to open his eyes to see the image of the Virgin and the other figures of the cathedral. In the, quote, midst of so much horror, the Virgin is less a source of comfort and more a ringleader. When he does open his eyes, it is not the Virgin, but all the other statues that are enlivened, rising up in defense, from the most holy to the most profane, including the animal figures of the carvings, worms, vermin, gargoyles. This is an overtly threatening version of the experience of Lee's Don Juan as he penetrated the Infantis tomb. But Lee has failed, uh, Pedro has failed to test that Don Juan incomprehensibly passed loyalty to the saint. So while Don Juan's lust for the Infanta enlivened the statues of her tomb and his apparent loyalty to the Virgin enlivened her, Pedro is a Pygmalion who worships the mortal woman too much and the goddess too little. And he's punished for it in a manner more akin to Camilo than Valdemar or Don Juan. He's driven there to base night in the cathedral with the moving statues. All he can say when he is found, still holding the bracelet, is hers, hers. Whether it's the sound of triumph, having obtained the bracelet from Maria at an exorbitant cost, or the sound of defeat, having been punished for thinking it could belong to anyone but the saint, is impossible to tell. Coming to our final story then, the kiss. As in the case of Don Juan, it is the patriarchal statue that does for the transgressor, and as in the case of poor superstitious Pedro, it is a violated church that provides the setting. Kiss is situated in the convent of St. Peter the Martyr in Toledo, and the sculptures of Doña Elvira and her husband Don Pedro, described in the story, are actually there. There is a socio-political element to the kiss, not unlike the Pygmalion tale itself, or the socio-political element in Valeri, with its practical American Martha. Here, our lusty protagonist is a member of the occupying forces of Napoleon's army, invading from France during the Peninsular War, 1807-1814. And the statues in question are those of a Spanish hero and his wife, Don Pedro having been a soldier with the great captain, Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordoba. The story begins with the occupation of the convent, seen here by these new troops, having already filled the palace and the town hall. And the narrator notes with the disdain uh, with which the French army apparently treated Toledo, 
and that sets the tone for what's to come. Meeting with his fellows in the Thames Square, the captain of this newest troop tells the tale of his first night in the church, enticing them with the idea that he has been kept awake by a beautiful woman, only to confess that she is, in fact, a sculpture. Despite their mockery, the captain sings her praises as a true Castilian lady, and he tells his fellow that he is beginning to understand Pygmalion's love of Galatea. They laugh some more, as you might imagine, and then one begins to jest that the captain is not taking them to see her because he wants to guard her jealously in the way perhaps that Count Valerio guarded his statue of. Captain laughs this off again, but then confesses that he is jealous of the statue of her husband alongside her, and would do violence to that male statue if not for fear of, quote, being treated like a madman. The soldiers insist on seeing the statues, and they come to the convent that evening for banquet. Getting drunk on champagne, the captain stares morosely, quote, like a desperate man at Doña Elvira. He begins to hallucinate through the firelight and his drinking, but she moves, prays, and looks down in disgust at the sacrilegious display of the soldiers in the holy place. He then leaps up and approaches the statue of her husband, rambling about the exhaustion of war and addressing him soldier to soldier, before splashing some of his wine on the statue's lips. Again, he shocks his friends who think he is being ridiculous. One of them warns him that, quote, such jokes usually cost one dearly, reminding him of an old tale of a group of hussars at a monastery at Pueblé who were run through by the swords of warrior statues in the cloister in the night. The men laugh at this story, but the captain seems to take it seriously, setting forth a theory of a half-life that beautiful sculptures might have been granted by an artist who was practically a god. Suddenly convinced that the statue of Elvira, who seems to incite him with her fantastic beauty, he says, or provoking him by parting her lips, the captain leaps up to kiss her. His friends shout after him to leave the dead alone, but the captain reaches up to the statue and then collapses with a cry onto the tomb, bleeding from his eyes, mouth and nose, with his face crumpled. In the final paragraph of the story, at the bottom here, the narrator explains the cause of the collapse. The, quote, motionless warrior had, paradoxically, raised his hand and knocked the captain down with a hideous blow. There endeth the lesson for the sacrilegious captain, willing to transgress against the beautiful female statue, not only in a church, but in front of her warrior husband. At the beginning, I alluded to work setting 19th century statue stories in the context of the Me Too movement, but it would also feel strange to talk about statues in this moment and not talk about the oddly intense sort of statue discourse we're currently experiencing in the UK. I think most people will have seen this picture before on social media, um, it shows police officers guarding the statue of Winston Churchill in Parliament Square during a protest around the square in nearby Scotland Yard after the police had disrupted a vigil to Sarah Everard, who was um, and recently killed by, uh, we believe, a police officer. Um, Churchill and this statue has become a particular focal point of reactionary protection for statues and historical figures as well as dissent from those who might share Martha and Camillo's sense that sometimes your history is better off left in the ground. Of course, our current statue discourse now has much less to do with any sort of religious piety and more to do ostensibly with patriotism. But both gestures seek to divert and prevent vigorous questioning of what statues represent and what they do for and to us. We began by thinking about how the idea of the divine right of kings might map onto the divine right of statues the right to go unquestioned and unchallenged by virtue of simply being a statue. This is it. Um, our chosen memorials, the things we've chosen collectively to look at obsessively, and I say this as somebody who walked past that statue every weekday for nearly a decade, um, they invite us to be, be, behave and think in certain ways. Reactionary gestures to increase protection for them seem to me an effort to do what these stories fantasize about statues doing for themselves, leering in viewers, and lashing out against supposed transgressions or disrespect. And I'll stop there. <laughs>